Hello everyone, it's Emma and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm very excited to talk to you about carbon footprints, rather exposing them for what they really are. So if you've been around the channel for a while, you were here um, maybe about, I don't know, nine months ago-ish where I took four different carbon footprint tests to see what my carbon footprint was. And that's really the main inspiration behind this video because during all of those tests, I got very wildly different results. Some told me I only emitted one ton of carbon. Some were like, you emit five tons of carbon, but I inputted all the same values into every tool. So I'm like, how accurate is this? How much does this really matter? Also, where did carbon footprint even come from? Who invented it? Why is it popularized these days and used a lot in the media and with companies? That's what we're gonna find out today. Before we actually dive in too far, if you'd like to read along, you can follow the blog post version linked down below, or if I talk a little bit too fast for you, I am notorious for that. You can change the speed of the video using the gear icon right down here. I also post new content every Monday and Thursday, Japan Standard Time, which is Sunday and Wednesday in the US. And my posting schedule is gonna start to vary a little bit, probably around June. I'm probably gonna have to cut down to one video a month as we are moving. That's also why I'm in this room, <laughs> is because our other, my normal filming room is quite messy right now. If you'd like to see the moving announcement, you can check it out on Instagram, or you can stay tuned for a few weeks where I'm gonna be doing a Q&A and answering questions like that. If you want to participate in that Q&A, leave your questions down below and just let me know that they're for the Q&A. With all that out of the way, let's jump right in. Let's first talk about the history of carbon footprints. So it originally started as the term ecological footprint. This was coined by William Rees and Mathis Wackernagel. I have no idea if I pronounced that correctly. So according to Britannica, an ecological footprint is the total area of land required to sustain an activity or population and include environmental impacts like water use, food production, and so forth. And this term was kind of coined in the early 90s. And it is different than the newly popularized term carbon footprint, and here's why. A carbon footprint is based on the amount of CO2 emissions associated with all the activities of a single person, business, or a country. This includes direct emissions like those from fossil fuels, heating, transportation, as well as goods and services used, AKA your invisible carbon footprint. Even if you consume something that you buy at the grocery store, you can't see that environmental footprint, but there is still one because it takes resources to make the stuff that you're buying. Where and why did we switch from ecological to carbon footprint? So companies have known they were the problem for decades. If you're really into the environmental movement, if you're you know, a big into environmentalism, you've probably heard that BP in particular and other gas companies have known they are one of the leading contributors to human caused climate change for the last 30 to 50 years. So pretty much starting as early as ads could run on TV, companies like this were running ads to try to convince us, the consumers, that we're to blame. They tried to make us feel guilty about what we consume instead of what they are making and the wasteful practices they use to make these things. And of course, yes, we need to be mindful about what we consume. We shouldn't overconsume. We shouldn't consume frivolously and stuff that requires a lot of energy and resources. But ultimately, we don't really have a choice as a consumer. All these companies are focused on money and production and not the environment. If we had more companies to choose from that were focusing on the environment, then we might be a little bit to blame if we're still picking the wasteful items. But we're not, we don't have green options to pick from. They're still very rare to find even now. That's why it's really silly to blame the consumer because we don't have the choice but to buy the products that they're selling to us. And it wasn't until 2000 that BP, British Petroleum, launched an ad, a campaign to try to convince us, the consumers, that we're to blame and not big oil. And so this is when BP actually coined the term carbon footprint. That's right, an oil company. <laughs> they were the ones who created this term. And in 2004, BP actually launched their own carbon footprint calculator. This was aimed to try to show the consumers how wasteful they are and what changes they can be making in their everyday lives. And now since then, over the last two decades approximately, the coin is plastered everywhere. Companies like Coca-Cola use it, Unilever, all these big companies, as well as ourselves. I mean, I still use it. And today, the, the term is still the same as it was in 2004. It's still used largely to convince the consumers that we're to blame and we need to make changes and not the companies are the ones who need to make changes. And again, don't get me wrong, we can make big impacts as individuals. We can make big changes and inspire others to make changes, but telling the consumers that they are the number one cause of climate change is so wrong. There are, uh, I forget the exact number, but I think it's 100 companies contribute to like 50% of climate change. I'll throw the actual stat on the screen, but like, it's not 100 people, 
it's 100 companies. But I actually don't hate carbon footprinting tools, and here's why. Yes, I hate the origins, and I hate that companies like BP are still trying to put the blame on the consumers today. That's all bad, but these tools are actually still useful. Though they aren't perfect, like we learned in that video about me taking four different carbon footprinting tests, they're still very useful. Um, I think they're especially useful for someone new to the movement, if they're like, okay, how wasteful am I living? Where can I make improvements? I think that's the key is looking at that and seeing where I can make improvements as an individual. Now, the big difference here is focusing on the fact that yes, I can make changes as an individual, but climate change is not my fault. I think that's key. So, you know, say someone's new to the movement and they eat a lot of meat, they fly a lot, they drive like a gas guzzling vehicle, they leave their lights on all the time and so forth. This would really help them to target like, okay, maybe I can reduce my red meat. Maybe I can find a bus or carpool instead. And it just kind of gets your mind thinking about what small changes you can make in your everyday lives to live more eco-friendly. I mean, I always knew that I flew a lot, but I really seeing it laid out in that tool and how much flying is a part of my carbon footprint really opened my eyes to the fact that, wow, I need to quit flying as much if possible. I talk about this a lot that I live on a really small island in the middle of the ocean. so getting off this island 99% of the time requires an airplane. I don't have the time and convenience to take a boat, unfortunately. Otherwise, I probably would take a boat, but I don't get that much time off. And when I do get time off, I don't wanna waste a week on a boat getting back to the US. I wanna get there quick so I can see my family. Anyway, that's just one thing from my carbon footprint testing that I learned. I still encourage you to take them and see what you can learn about your own habits. Just looking at all of that laid out in a nice colorful graph makes it so much easier to grasp than just you know, making random changes. So I, th I think it's really hard to jump into zero waste with no direction. So using these tools as a stepping stone into zero waste kind of gives you a little bit of direction. And I still think corporations like BP and other very polluting companies creating these tools and pushing them on the consumers is wrong. But there are, there are great environmental companies out there, um, like the World Wildlife Fund. They have a great tool and they're not pushing it on consumers. They're not like, take this test, you're causing climate change. They're more like, use this as a tool to see what changes you can make. So what should we do moving forward? I say continue using the tools, but don't use BP's tool. Don't use another oil company or plastic producing polluting company's tool because and that's just encouraging them that, ooh, the consumers do think it's their fault. No, use something from like an environmental corporation business like the World Wildlife Fund or something else. And then again, use it as a tool to learn about yourself. Please do not think that climate change is your fault. And right along those lines is we need to turn around and put the pressure right back on BP and other companies. When they call us out for, mm, you're driving too much and not biking enough, you're doing X, Y, Z. We need to turn around and be like, you're spilling oil into the ocean. You're one of the leading contributors to climate change. Point the fingers right back and tell them to improve their practices. That goes for all companies, not just BP. And here's this tweet I saw, and it was it's a tweet about BP introducing their carbon footprinting tool and some guy, I don't quite remember, but then the guy came back and was like, I pledge not to spill oil into the ocean, just kind of calling them out. But again, we need to do our part too. Not just calling them out, but making individual actions as well. Because our small individual actions do have a really big impact, especially when multiplied and especially over a long sustained period of time. So I talk about this a lot too. You know, it's great that I individually quit using plastic water bottles because I would probably use a thousand plastic water bottles per year, but it doesn't have quite the impact as if I were to encourage others to do the same. Because for example, say I reduce 1000 plastic water bottles every year, but then I tell 10 more people to do it. That's 10,000 plastic water bottles. And then they just keep telling more and more people we're up to a million, a billion plastic water bottles that don't have to be produced. So that's what I mean. Our small, our small individual actions still really do have a big impact. So I don't wanna lessen that at all. We need to put pressure on our corporations, businesses, politicians, as well as make our own individual actions because supply and demand, voting with our dollar really do make a big impact. Showing companies that we don't want red meat, we don't want plastic, we don't want X, Y, Z, they're gonna change. We've already seen this, um, was it Dove who created the refillable deodorant or something? Seventh generation is now using less plastic and more paper. Companies will listen in order to make money. Motives aren't great, <laughs> but they will listen. If people aren't buying their plastic products, they're gonna make products that people will buy and they will be more environmentally friendly because we're telling them to. I guess the moral of this story is, is don't strive for perfection and don't let these tools be negative. Let them be a positive way that you can make an impact every single day. 
Start by making one small change today, especially if you're new to the movement, and then encourage others to make that same small change too. And then maybe in a week, you wanna implement something else into your life. Take it one small step at a time. You don't have to go zero waste overnight because like one of my favorite quotes says, we don't need 100 people living zero waste perfectly. We need everyone living zero waste imperfectly. I talk about that a lot. My practical ways, I live zero waste. My non-aesthetic ways, I live zero waste. I just do me and I try to reduce my impact on the planet and I encourage you to do the same. That is it for today's video. Thank you so much for coming along with me and learning more about carbon footprints and their evil origins. No, I'm just kidding. They weren't good origins. Hope that you learned something today and found this valuable. If you did, I would love if you shared this with others or gave a thumbs up on this video or leave a comment down below. Any of the following would make my day. Like I said, I am doing a Q&A here in a few weeks. So if you have questions for that, leave them down below. But that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, remember that these small changes you make really do have a big impact in the long run. Bye guys. Hello. <laughs> Why did I do that? <gasps> oh, ow! Uh, that wasn't that wasn't a really good sentence, but it was close enough. Mm, never mind. Don't don't include that. You're one of the leading causers. Causers. I I, I uh, words. Um. Only 18 minutes. Yes.